My name is Neha. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. Can you hear me OK? Yes? OK, great. Thank you so much for coming, even though I, I know that whole crew right there. For the rest of you, it really means a lot that you're here. <laughs> um, so currently, I am I, a software engineer at Sidewalk Labs and also the very recent founder of an Indian clothing site called Lotto. Um, but before that, I was a mere Noogler working on Google Maps. Never show this photo to anybody. Um, so you may recognize some of my work. So it includes the mini-map in the bottom left, the popular times graph, the send to your phone button. But something that I really enjoyed doing behind the scenes was making Google Maps more accessible for keyboard users. So let's start with a pretty sobering fact. According to the US Census Bureau, nearly one in five Americans have a disability. Furthermore, of these 57-ish million, 8.1 have difficulty seeing and 19.9 have difficulty lift, lifting or grasping. So that is 28 million Americans who cannot use a computer or a mouse in a traditional manner. So you may be wondering, well, what tools can they use right now to alleviate this? And there's actually quite a lot. For those who are nearly or completely blind or with limited motor function, um, there's a variety of different screen readers that are available. Um, for those with low vision, there are screen magnifiers. And for those with color blindness, there are color filters, inverters, reducers, a bunch of different tools. So right away, I want to say this. Accessibility is not a niche market. There is a huge, huge population you serve to gain by making your product accessible. So maybe some of you are now thinking, OK, so what? I have 100 million, 200 million users. I don't need 28 million. But that's not the only reason to make your product accessible. Um, so first of all, accessibility is a right. And when you work with government-funded entities, it's also quite often a requirement. So if you don't make your product accessible, you could face bad press and a lawsuit just like this. Second of all, the community talks. And if your product is the first one of its kind to be accessible, you will have the competitive advantage of a very active and loyal user base. And lastly, it's just the right thing to do. Um, when I was working on Google Maps, I went to an accessibility meetup. and. This is kind of in the middle of my work, and so I was just kind of asking around, you know, what, what online mapping services do you use today? I haven't really found any of them to be super accessible. And I was really surprised. I mean, essentially they said, yeah, we've given up. Like, we just try to make do, go to the places where we know to go, but we have friends who are scared of even leaving their house because they don't want to feel lost or embarrassed. And that, to me, was like such a motivator. I, I truly believe we all deserve to be able to go outside and experience what we want to experience. And the fact that this population was hurting because no one had thought to give them this like very fundamental tool made me really want to follow through. Um, so that brings me to my second key takeaway, which is accessibility opens doors. Whether you're dealing with big government or end users, accessibility can easily be your differentiator. So by this point, I've hopefully convinced you that accessibility and therefore listening to me talk for the next 10 minutes is worth your time. Um, so the next question is, how do you do it? Well, I think there are two main parts. And the first is user testing. So when I was in college, I worked on this project um, involving the Braille Writing Tutor, which is this Arduino-based device you see here. And so basically, this was a piece of hardware that they would hook up to a PC, and they could like the teachers could help their children learn Braille through games. Um, but it was being used in rural India, where power just was not reliable. So they wanted to port it to an Android, which you know, they could charge and then use a little bit better. Um, but to further throw a wrench into things, not only did I have to move the software over, but also it was going to be used by these blind teachers who had never even held a smartphone before with their blind students. So my group spent the entire first week just trying to immerse ourselves in accessibility. We, you know, we turned all of our screen readers on. We downloaded a bunch of apps. We, um, we just tried to see kind of what was out there. And we even practiced writing Braille. So how many of you know anything about Braille? <laughs> I, oh, well, 
good. <laughs> I, well, I didn't at the time. So essentially Braille is like you have these six, cell, like six dot cells. And so the idea is that you know, some are on and some are off. And you know, when you think about it next to like an elevator lobby, the ones that are on are raised, right? So actually when you're writing Braille on paper, in order to, um, in order to produce like the, I don't know who can see this, but in order to produce the raised version, you actually have to flip the paper, write the mirror image of every letter from right to left, like puncture the hole, and then it can be readable from left to right with the finger. So like you're not learning one alphabets, you're learning, learning two alphabets, you're learning two writing directions. It's, it's a lot to handle mentally. Um, and so for our first iteration, my team built this really simple Android app and we found someone to run and record user research sessions with teachers in India. And we sent him this you know, pretty straightforward research guide, 20 minutes of an introduction to Android and 20 minutes of a think aloud like a set of think aloud tasks, which for those of you who don't know are just essentially, you know, perform this task and think aloud while you do it. Um, and when he got back to us, it was so clear that we had severely underestimated the learning curve that we were assuming would just happen. Um, the first Android introduction took two hours and it was scheduled for 20 minutes. So that leads me to my third takeaway, which is, Empathize with your users and their norms. So don't, for example, make the mistake we did and assume you know they have all this hardware in their life and they have to just figure out how to orient it and that part's solved. Like that's not what we have to think about here, because you really need to think about the holistic experience for a user and what they're used to and what they're not. Um, so the second part of the how is the actual technical implementation. So when I joined Google after college, there was this huge initiative to abide by the mission and actually make the core products universally accessible. So you know, I had, I had just joined, I kind of had some experience in college and I was at my first all hands and so I was like, all right, why not? I got this, I can do this, I'm the new person, which was um, a classic Noogler mistake. Um, but I started reading up on web accessibility, evaluating Google Maps, and I quickly realized it was a disaster. Google had this internal accessibility rating and you essentially evaluated core functionality against like a set of standards. And I, I ended up just faced with this giant red spreadsheet, like there is nothing accessible about the product as is. And on a scale of zero to five, we were a zero. Um, so I spent the next few months digging through the entire code base and I was sort of able to boil down the technical principles into four main pieces. So the first is um, add labels and roles to each DOM element. So these essentially tell a screen reader um, what the element is and how it fits into the larger organization of the app. The second is handle key presses. So you should make sure that a user can you know, use their arrow keys to scroll between a list and also hit enter to you know, activate a button, for example. The third is enforcing a tab order. So that is the order of the elements when you hit tab and your focus is moving around the screen. Because if you think about it, like the app is laid out in a certain way for a reason. Visually, you, you want the user to process the, the information in that order. So you have to also make sure that when going with a screen reader, you're giving them that same order, that same context. Um, and the last is maintain focus. Um, and by focus, I mean, again, keyboard focus. So say a user focuses on a button and they hit enter and it opens a modal and then they close the modal. Where does their focus go? It probably should go back to the original button that opened the modal, but a lot of browsers will just drop the focus entirely and that leaves the user completely lost. They reset from the beginning of the page. They have to wait find all the way back to where they were. So it's really important to kind of never let them get lost in the ether and always make sure these, these state transitions are handled. So knowing all this, how would you guys make Google Maps, like this map itself, comprehensible to someone without sight? Anybody? <laughs> Sound. 
Good. Yes. What, what, would, what would you um, what would you say about the map? Uh, there's, no, there's no wrong answer. <laughs> Yeah, so when the screen reader is on the map, how would you verbalize the information that we're seeing visually now? Um, perhaps the city location. Okay, so the city location. Yeah, probably need to know what the frame is on top of, right? So roughly where in New York City somewhere. Yeah. Like where is this frame actually? Right. And then you could move to higher level things like East Village, Lower Manhattan, two bridges, the river, probably a big two. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, high level, like geographical context. Yeah. Yeah. Compass directions. All right. Well, don't worry. I solved this for all of you. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to show you a quick demo. I also have to re download Chromebox. Chromebox spoken feedback is ready. Great. Okay. AMC Village 7. Sorry. Hello. AMC Village 7. Google Maps. Directions. Button region. This is not what I wanted. Okay. So Map. Main. 1, 2 Avenue 2 Anthology Film Archive. Ma search. Okay. Search Google Sorry. Maps. A search Google Maps. Combo box auto completion list. So essentially, um, when you land on Google Maps, I can refresh auto it. Auto completion. Please, please see this. Google Maps. So that's Google Maps. Search. Search Google Maps. It goes, box list. it goes immediately to the search box because that is the primary action when you're on Google Maps. And so you can use tab, like I was saying, to kind of go through all the elements in order. So I'll just search button. Directions button. So you see it said directions, which describes the element, that's the label, and then button because that's the type of element. So I know I could, you know, hit enter on it. Um, and so uh, I'll try to spare you the sound, but if you watch this like orange box, you'll see that it does search. Google, zero, Google, show your like move button. around the map the same way your eye might. Um, Content terms. We're in the Lane. fine print. Set, exit. Map. Okay. Main. One apple cell hub, two blue note, three by Chloe, four D cookie dough confections, five dummy Ansel bakery, six film form, seven Houston Street, nine view more in area navigation. Okay. So here is essentially what I decided on. So basically, Google Maps is secretly 256 tiles that are adjacent to each other. And so I thought, OK, this tile is a really great deterministic way of understanding the map, right? Like, it's never changing a number. At any given zoom level, every tile kind of has what it has. So what I did was I kind of drew this box around the tile that you're specifically on. And I extracted all the. Um, point of interest from that tile. And so then I give them to you in this numbered list. So if there is ever more than seven, eight and nine are kind of like the next page and previous page buttons. So if I were to click nine, it would kind of give me the next set of POIs here. Um, and then furthermore, you can pan. And every time you pan, you move exactly one tile away. Moving east, 1, 2 Avenue, 2 AMC, Village, 7, 3 Astor, Place, 4 Leaker Street, 5 Sorry. Broadway, Lafayette Street, 6 Kit, 7 McSorley's, Old Dale House, 9 View, more in area, navigation. OK, <laughs> so, so my thinking was, you know, like say you load Google Maps when you're home, actually, it, or when you're anywhere, it centers you on your current location. So my thinking was, OK, we'll start at the center. And you know if you move two left, two up, the way to get back home is two down, two right. You're never going to lose like any single piece of information. Um, and second of all, like you can click one of these, or you can type one of these numbers to actually click on the POI. So if I want to learn more about McSorley's Ale House. Side, 1, 2 Avenue, 2 AMC, 1, 2 Avenue, 2 Astor, Place, 3 Bleecker Street, 4 Broadway, Lafayette Street, 5 Kit, 6 McSorley's Old Ale House, 7 Stump, 9 View, More in Area, Navigation. So you can see that even though, so it said showing side panel, which means, you know, you opened it. But even though the panel opened, I didn't change the focus. You're still exactly where you were. You're still on that same square. I, like, reshifted the map to ensure that. Um, and, yeah, so that. Does anybody have any? Oh, wait, no questions till the end. Um, but so, yeah, this is kind of just, I guess, like my baby project. But I'll go back to, let me turn this off. Um, so that leads me to my fourth takeaway, which is don't be afraid to get creative. 
So it's pretty clear that you know there's no hard and fast rule to make a map accessible. Like you have all these frameworks guiding you, but it, it really took kind of a lot of thinking about how to put all these pieces together to get that map to make sense to someone who couldn't actually see it. Um, and so with this takeaway, I basically mean to say like it's a growing community and it's always welcoming contributions. And so you shouldn't be afraid to kind of um, go outside the box if you're adding to it. So um, to end my presentation, I'd like to share just a quick little anecdote. So I had just gotten Google, so I just gotten Google Maps to a level four out of five. I was very close. It was right before I was done with the map. And I kind of had like a working demo of it, but I wasn't totally set on pursuing it because um, like I said, I had to get in touch with the tile team so they would pass on those point of interest and that was like a bigger payload and there was kind of a lot of red tape in that area. Um, but so I was really interested in accessibility regardless and I wanted to go to this conference called CSUN, which is not reflected in this name, but anyways. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's an acronym. Um, so on the schedule when I got there, there was this session called Google Maps. And I thought to myself, what? Like, I'm definitely the only person here. Like, what could they be talking about? And so I went to the session, I sat in the audience, and the first thing that the speaker said was, I don't know what happened to Google Maps, but it is so much easier to use. And her entire session was the work that I had done. Like she was just going through all the stuff. She was going through all the different things that she could hear. Like even the popular times graph, you can hear it. You can hear the, the values of the bars and all this random stuff. Um, and so towards the end of the presentation, you know, it's Q&A. And someone obviously asked, well, what about the map? Like, what are they going to do about the map? And I finally raised my hand and, you know, revealed myself. I was like, it's me. Like, <laughs> like that is what I was, you know, what I've been working on, what I wanted to bring to you guys, and what I came here to kind of, like, test the waters for. And kind of what happened next was very unbelievable. Like, everyone just, like, stood up, formed a queue, everyone was like shaking my hands, giving me business cards, and they were like, how do I test this? Where do I find you? Where are you? And I was like, okay, Google booth, all day, like I'll be there. Um, but like, I mean, that to me was just the biggest affirmation of the why I was talking about earlier. Like, I had somehow from miles and miles away managed to get one person so excited about Google Maps that she was delivering a conference session about it, that she was sharing it with this larger community. Um, and once I kind of like put myself out there, they were so excited and eager to help and like they were ready to become the most loyal Google Maps users, right? So um, to end the evening, I'd just like to share a list of resources that I found really helpful when working on Google Maps. And I really, really hope that you end up using them too. Um, and with that, thank you. I think the slides are available, by the way. <laughs> Any questions? Oh. All right, I'll, I know you, so. Were there any features that you felt like after creating the accessible accommodations for them? Should actually be redesigned better, even for sighted users? That's a good question. Um, yeah, actually, so I don't know if you remember this, but basically the thing on the right used to open up and have like a slideshow of photos. And that was kind of just the worst one because okay, what do you get from iterating through that photos? Like photo one, photo two, photo three. And I just Things that are so inherently visual, I struggled with because I didn't want to restrict your access to knowing that they were there. But I also, like, unless the author or unless the photographer provided a caption, I just had no really good way of doing that. And so that was, yeah, a tough one.
she was talking about how they're using Google Maps, and they're okay with um, finding the corner on the street, but they're not okay with what's actually on the street because they can't see the stores. They don't know what's in there. Yeah. So they need more description, not only like the square on the map and you know what's nearby. I mean, this is all already there, but if you want to concentrate maybe on this or add to Google Maps more information for them, they just can point like what's on the ground. Yeah. Um, does anybody remember like the Pac-Man April Fool's joke? So that was like. That was an idea that I had for mobile. I told the mobile team, okay, we've already built this thing where you can literally traverse the streets, and so why not kind of incorporate that into wayfinding, like you're walking down the street, you're Pac-Man, you know what's on your left and right. Unfortunately, I don't know, like the other teams on Google Maps just didn't seem as excited about this. Like they, I think, had a lot of more pressing features to keep up with the competitors in the space, whereas Google Maps, I think we were able to take um, more of a holistic approach because we felt pretty secure with our user base. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree. Like, I think mobile wayfinding has a long ways to go, and I, there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. So how can we consider what what are ways to be able to really incorporate that into the products that we work on so that like emotion doesn't get left behind? Yeah, well I think honestly like user testing can really bring a lot of that to light. For example, um, the Braille Writing Tutor project I talked about. So all they asked us to do was make, you know, the gameplay app. But after, you know, listening to these teachers, a big thing that we kept hearing was that the students loved hearing the teachers' voices. Like it brought them so much more comfort than this like talk over or voice over, you know, voice. And so knowing that, we actually made a second app where the teachers could go in and record the words and phrases. And then we'd pull in those recordings into the gameplay app to kind of make it feel more, you know, like your teacher was actually sitting next to you playing this game with you. So like I think um, yeah, just having these sit downs with your users and really figuring out where that emotional part is and then how you can address it would just go a long way. Um, first off, this is awesome. I, and I've used that Chrome box before and gone through other sites where you just are completely bombarded with everything at once. Yeah. So, it's just like, um, so many apps tie, like, incorporate Google Maps into them. Like, I work on an app where it's like you put buildings onto Google Maps. I was wondering, does this work within that, like within other apps, or only as a freestanding, like I just go to Google Maps and it works? I, so I left Google, but at the time that I left, the embed team was a different team, and they were using a subset of the features um, just to kind of reduce like the page load. So I actually haven't checked to see whether they incorporated the accessibility features or not, but that's a, a great question. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, promoted that and, you know, different, different apps that use maps somehow. Yeah. So well, does the accessibility features that they translate to the Street View aspect of Google Maps? Um, yeah, so I did Street View too. So again, it's kind of hard because it's a little more visual, but um, when you're like moving forward in a directional space, I like indicate which direction you're on. If there's any sort of caption about the landmark or the street corner, like I enunciate that. Um, so pretty much like when you're on Street View, anything you could read is something you could also hear, and then just kind of the wayfinding aspect was highlighted. But yeah, that's, that was another pretty challenging one. <laughs>